it's my privilege to introduce the filmmaker uh, Toshi Washizu. Uh, I guess I'd like to say that very quickly after arriving from Japan, he enrolled in the uh, filmmaking department at San Francisco State University. Uh, he also began working for Fuji TV, and it was this uh, coalition between him, Fuji TV, and the J Japanese speaking uh, Society of America that, uh, you know, led to the creation of Issei. Uh, the first generation. Um, I'm very happy that uh, Toshi has been able to come out today. Uh, I'd just like to say very briefly that I actually found him. I, I thought I was going to be looking in Japan for someone working for NHK or something. But as it turned out, uh, he's right here in, in the Richmond. Uh, he's not really making documentary film uh, at this point, but uh, I found him in terms of uh, San Francisco poetry groups in places like uh, Noe Valley. And uh, I think it really is part of his filmmaking ability uh, in terms of, uh, it comes from poetic sensibility. Uh, I think you can see it in the film. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the filmmaker of Issei, the, the first generation, uh, Mr. Toshi Washizu. Thank you for coming. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Japanese, uh, National Japanese American Historical Society and UCLA's Aratani Endowed Chair for this event. I made this film some 30 years ago. I was still young and beautiful with a full <laughs> film. In 1984, it was broadcast twice on San Francisco TV stations. Then it lay buried deep in an underground bunker, forgotten for years. Earlier this year, out of thin air, a savior on a white horse arrived to rescue and bring the film back to life. His name, Professor Lane Hirabayashi. A digital restoration of the film and subsequent public showings were made possible because of his generous efforts. Today, when I look at those essay, it feels like my old family returning home after a 30 year absence. Thank you, Lane, for turning the light back on their faces and keeping their stories alive. Filmmaking is a collaborative work. This film was a minuscule budget production made possible with the uh, help of many volunteers, the Japanese Speaking Society and Fuji TV. It was a crude production and the picture and sound quality suffers from it. Hopefully the film speaks for itself. I'd like to dedicate this showing to the memories of the Issei and Jamie Kippen, who came to this project as an assistant then became my filmmaking partner and best friend. Jamie died 10 years ago in a tragic traffic accident, but today he's here with us in spirit. I'll be happy to answer any questions. First, I will read the production notes. The making of Issei, the first generation. America was as far away as heaven. The first group of emigrating Japanese left their homeland for Hawaii in 1868. There were less than 100 of them. In 1922, Miki Adachi, 20, arrived in Walnut Grove, California. Being a country bumpkin, I really didn't know what America would be. She recalled of her arrival 62 years earlier. In 1974, I left my hometown, Shizuoka, to find America. Young and insolent, I couldn't wait to get out of the crowded alleys, the narrow island, the small-minded country. I flew to San Francisco like a migrating bird. As soon as I arrived in America, I found myself a bird of a different feather. I was a stranger in a foreign land. Born in Shizuoka, 
and at the foot of Mount Fuji and reared in the culture and tradition of my homeland. The landscape I knew, the atmosphere, the smells, the taste were all Japanese. I was so clueless that I thought I'd never be able to eat Japanese food in America. <laughs> Learning English was the first hurdle. It made me taciturn and diffident. Perhaps that's why I chose film, primarily a visual medium with a universal visual language and permanent silence as my means of expression. I earned an MFA in film at San Francisco State in 1983 and became a filmmaker working for Fuji TV. In the summer of 1983, the Japanese-speaking society of Northern California approached us with a proposal to produce a documentary film about the Issei in California. The Issei, mostly in their 80s and 90s at the time, were a vanishing breed, and they wanted to keep a living record of their history. Although it was a shoestring production, I jumped at the opportunity. The Issei were my ancestors who spoke the language of my home country. They were like my own family. I wanted to hear their stories and learn of their lives. I began the research to develop a script, reading publications, viewing old film footage and still photos, listening to audio interviews, and scouting locations. By the end of October 1983, I finished the first draft of the script. Soon, the filming started and continued over a period of five months on Angel Island, in Walnut Grove, Watsonville, Sacramento, Davis, and San Francisco. With some 50 hours of raw footage, the editing and post-production took me five additional months, beginning in February 1984 and finishing on July 2nd, 1984. Throughout my visits with those Issei, I was struck by how gracious and generous they were. Everyone welcomed my crew into their modest homes with open arms, as if we were family. After the filming, their families served tea and sweets to us like honored guests. In Walnut Grove, our visits became the town events. The mayor gathered a group of volunteers to help my two-man crew, as I could only afford one professional assistant. The mayor insisted that we sleep in his house, and the town's women prepared a sumptuous meal after each day's shoot. The Issei interviewees opened their hearts and talked to me candidly with total lack of pretension or bitterness for the years of their hardship. Stoic and resilient. Shigeru Nishimi recalled the time when the war broke out and the evacuation notice came. I said to myself that humans had good times after bad times. Takawa Shizu declared to her husband, I decided three years after I arrived in America that I would die here. I would stay here no matter what the results of the war. These Issei women's determination to establish a home for their children was resolute. Immigrating to America forced them to confront cultural barriers and to understand that one creates one's sense of community. It's not a given. As I embarked on this film project, I began to see many parallels between their stories and my own as a new essay. Their journey became my journey of discovery. Listening to their intimate stories in close up, I learned more about Japan and myself. It was as if being away from our homeland made us see ourselves more clearly in a long shot. Through this film, I discovered that the same Japanese soul was coursing through their blood and mine. 
in my youth, I left Japan anxious to get away. The film gave me an opportunity to come home at last. Living alone in Sacramento, 87-year-old Bunzo Aso spoke of his belief. I believe in enjoying things as they are. To spend each day with a sense of gratitude. I don't have much to complain about. 91-year-old Masa Kobayashi's words spoke volumes. My father was pressuring me to come home, but my kids were born here and their education. That's when I decided not to come back home. I was raised in Japan until age 23. I was taught everything the Japanese way, and that's influenced my life so much. After all, the soul I have deep inside is Japanese. So I try to take the good from both cultures. I never regretted living in America. Finally, if you wish to contact me, my email address is washizufilm at gmail.com. Thank you very much.